So hello everyone, and it's a particular pleasure today to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Alini Vidotto. And I must say, um, I have known Alini a long time, and our first encounter was basically Alini leaning at a door frame saying, Christiane, I have seen this paper that you and uh, Luca have published. I know the solution for this. So, and since then, she basically started the, the um, star planet interaction thinking um, quite fundamentally. So, and therefore, I'm, I'm particularly proud to introduce you today. So, Alini has done a PhD in 2009 in Sao Paulo, in, in Brazil. And then she came to St. Andrews until 2014, where she actually won her first big grant. It was a Royal Astronomic Society Research Fellowship. So, first success, well, second success. <laughs> And then she moved on to Dublin, after, no, to, to, to Geneva, sorry. And there you had your second or third big success with winning an Ambizione Fellowship, which is also not just done left-handedly. Um, thereafter, she was called to uh, Dublin, to the Trinity College, as associate, and then reached associate professor level. And here, everything unfolded, I would say. So you won the, what is it, an ear? ER, an IRC laureate award, maybe you want to say what it is at some point, and then eventually the ERC consolidator grant. And this was then passed to Leiden, where she then, uh, where she is now um, an associate professor at the University of Leiden. And therefore, I'm very happy to have you here to give the talk today. A mute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christiane. Thank you all for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, you have, I have to note that uh, Christiane mentions the, the, the success, but there's a lot of failures in between. So <laughs> there's always the, the, the sad part that we don't mention. But yeah, we keep, uh, we keep uh, pursuing this. So I want to uh, talk today about this is my pandemic team. Uh, so I want to talk today about the work these people have done with me during these two years where we were all isolated. We could not go to conferences or not in person, and uh, we could not exchange so much our results. So I want to, to talk about uh, mostly the, the work they, that have been um, done in my group in the past uh, two years and a half. So I entitled these the interactions with uh, wing, uh, wings and exoplanets or stars and exoplanets. And I have here a nicer title, Exospace Weather. So let's start. Um, I'm going to talk about um, space weather. If I can make this move today. And essentially, uh, I'll talk about two forms of stellar activity. Uh, the first one is the activity that comes in the form of radiation. So I'm talking here about emission from the corona of the star, for example, also emission from flares. And also I'll talk about the particle side of the stellar activity, which comes in the form of a stellar wind, for example, or coronal mass ejection. So the wind being the quiescent state of, uh, of these outflows, while the coronal mass ejections being bursty events. So together, these phenomena uh, shape uh, the environment surrounding planets, and I will focus today on how this then affect the scape of the planet. It could affect also the, the evolution of the planet. And um, to start, to, to put this in context, whenever I talk about stars, I'm talking about low mass stars, so spectral type uh, F, G, K, and M. Uh, and whenever I talk about exoplanets, I'm, if I say planets, I'm usually thinking about an exoplanet and usually closing exoplanet. But so uh, we are in the same page. So what I have here, let me start from the right plot. We have the, uh, 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 a figure showing how the luminosity in the X-ray or in the extreme ultraviolet varies as a function of age. So these are our empirical um, um, based models, let's say. So that's the evolution of the high energy activity of a star. And what you see here is that overall, without worrying too much about the middle part, but overall what we see here is that the, when the star is younger, it emits more X-ray and more UV fluxes. And, it, and this then decays with time as the star ages. So if you go then to the plot on the left, what you have here is the winged a, wind, a very important stellar wind property, which is the mass loss rate, as a function of X-ray flux. And again, we have some points there. It's very hard to observe uh, winds from low mass stars. 
but we do seem to see a trend of an increase in mass loss rate as a function of X-ray fluxes. Now, if you think about the plot here on the right, you can imagine that the stars that are on the right of this plot, they are younger. So in general, it starts with larger X-ray fluxes. They are younger, they are more active. They usually have a faster rotation. And as the star ages, you see then their wings are weaker or become weaker. So these are also the older stars. So this is actually a very interesting uh, property of cool star uh, in a way that the wind, it carries away mass, but more importantly, carries away angular momentum. So when you have, when you remove angular momentum from the star, the star starts to spin down. And because the activity of the star is generated in, inside the star through dynamo processes and dynamo is related to rotation, if the star rotates slower, the dynamo action is also going to be weaker, which means the magnetic activity weakens as the star age. And, and also we see this uh, weakening, weakening of the activity, for example, in X-ray and UV luminosity. So that's an, uh, a loop that happens through the life of a star. And when it comes down to uh, looking at the, prop, the environment surrounding planets, I would like to highlight the main difference we see when we are here on Earth around the sun orbiting at about one AU. So this is the about 215 solar radii from the sun versus a hot Jupiter or a closing planet in which the planet orbits so close to the star that this distance here is a few stellar radii. So if we, if we stop to think about this, this very differences in distance, you can already imagine that here, this planet would face a much stronger or a much denser plasma coming from the star uh, a larger magnetic field, so the ambient field here is, is stronger than in here. So in general, it will also have a higher radiative flux, so flux decays with R squared. And in general, velocities, uh, it's a bit, uh, it could be weaker here, but uh, because of the orbital velocity of the planet, it might end up being similar to what the velocity of the solar wind at the position of the Earth. But in general, this planet they have a, a much harsher environment. Now that we, this is the context of my talk, and I would like to focus on three uh, aspects here. The first one, I'll talk about star-planet interaction at radio wavelengths. So we're gonna tune in to the planets. Then I'll talk about scape and atmospheric scape in closing planets and how this changes the, 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 ev the evolution of the planet. And, and at the end of my talk, I want to combine what we are discussing in part one and part two, which is essentially how the wind interacts with the escaping atmosphere. And most of the work I'm showing you here today, they are um, modeling and, and numerical efforts. So let me start first on the, the first part of the talk, which is on the star planet interaction in radio. And here I would like to highlight two forms of emission. So this is, let's say, the most typical emission we are familiar with, which is the aurora emission that comes from the magnetic field of the planet. And there is also another type of emission I would to, to highlight, which is the emission that uh, the planet is inducing in the star. And there is a lot of new work in coming out in this area, and I think this is quite a promising uh, field. So the first form of emission, uh, which I call here type uh, one, just, just just differentiate between the second one. So this is the emission coming from the magnetic field of the planet. So I have here a, a, a movie just illustrating how the solar wind interacts with the Earth magnetosphere. So these are the magnetic field lines of the Earth. And as you see, the, the as the solar wind comes in, it pushes the, the field, magnetic field lines of the planet that is that are in the night side, they, they get together, they have different polarities and therefore they reconnect. So when they reconnect, they release electrons and these electrons then spiral along the magnetic field of the planet. And this then causes uh, a cyclotron emission. So if you remember from your uh, first, uh, your undergraduate studies in electromagnetic classes, the cyclotron emission the cyclotron frequency is proportional to the magnetic field of the planet. So here is a, a formula, a little formula to keep in mind. 
So let's say if I emit, if I observe a planet emitting at a certain frequency, I can then plug in, in this formula and find the magnetic field of the planet. So this is very interesting if we ever detect um, uh, this sort of emission, because then it can tell us about uh, information about the magnetic field of the planet, which we, we think might be also related to uh, habitability as the magnetic field could form some form some sort of protection against uh, erosion of the atmosphere of a planet. And if you look in the solar system, it's very interesting that the, 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 dot, the field dots here, they are planets in the solar system that are magnetized. You see that the radio, they, the radio power they emit is proportional to the power of the solar wind that incides in that is dissipated in the magnetosphere of these planets and you you see there is a it's several orders of magnitude uh, this relation uh, reaches and jupiter here is our um the, the the largest emitter in the solar system and for many years now there has been this ex expectation that if you go to a planet that is very close to the star remember i told you that clo a closing planet in faces a harsher wind environment so therefore it has a higher incident power coming from this uh, the wind of this, this the host star we think that the exoplanets would actually emit much stronger radio uh, powers than even jupiter However, these decades of observations, and I don't think we have a very firm conclusion of this yet. Uh, and one, 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 one problem could be that we don't have the, the incident power uh, correctly. Maybe it's just, we cannot just extrapolate from solar system values. And I want to highlight two, um, uh, a recent work, well, not too re that recent, so it's a, a couple of years ago already, by Robert Kavanaugh. Uh, on modeling the the emission coming from or predicting the emission of this particular uh, system so hd189733 uh, so this is a um, uh, k-dwarf a planet with which is about eight eight uh, stellar radii away and what you see here on the top are magnetic field maps so these are the magnetic fields at the surface of the stars and they are, were obtained at different epochs. So they are more or less one year apart from each other. And then what you see at the bottom are the wind simulations that uh, we run for this system. So our wind simulations, they essentially take it, taking the boundary condition here is the map that we see up there. And these funny lines that we have here are the, the, the magnetic field lines that are embedded in the stellar wind. And what you see in color is the velocity of, the, of this wind. So we have here something between zero and 300 kilometers per second. Uh, I'll point out the surface here. It's called the Alvin surface. I'll come back to that. And the orbit here is just shown for illustration. So what we did in this work, we, 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 we model the wind of the star. And the only difference between this different three, the, the three panels is the magnetic map that we used. And then we use the we obtain the values of the wind properties along the orbit, and we compute the radio emission that uh, HG 189733b would uh, have. And what we find here is we need to assume a magnetic field for the planet. So this is something we can discuss uh, uh, later. But what we have here is the flux density as a function of the three simulations, the three epochs, and what we see is that we predict quite strong fluxes. But then you look at LOFAR, and in this collaboration, we, one of the, the collaborators observed the system with LOFAR and did not detect anything. So we already knew when we published this that there was no detection. And, and still we predict something that could be detected. So there, there, we started thinking, is there something that is preventing the escape or generate, or the generation itself of radio emission? And the list is, um, let me just before I move there, I say here, searches have failed to find radio emission from hot Jupiters, except from this recent result. And I'll come back to this in the next slide. But the list is why can we not observe radio emission uh, is not small, so it goes on, and I don't want to go through all of them. But one possibility that I highlight here is that this process is beamed. It's like a lighthouse, uh, uh, you know, coming in your in your direction and out. And when you see this cone of emission passing through you, it's actually a hollow cone. So you only see the the 
the walls of the cone. So when you see this emission passing through you, you see a burst. You, so if you're not observing at the right time, maybe you are not going to get, uh, you're not going to detect this. And, and this is actually, a, this bursty type of emission was actually observed recently with a different star, a different hot Jupiter system, Taubu, um, at about 15 to 30 megahertz. And, and I'm very excited to, about this, but I, I know the authors, if you read the paper carefully, they are, they are very careful to say whether it's an emission or not, because I think it's still, uh, there's still room for negotiating what, what that is. So it needs indeed follow up. But if this, if you remember the formula I just showed you for the, the, the cyclotron frequency, if you, if you use the emission happening in this, uh, in this uh, frequency range, you can then estimate what is the magnetic field strength of the planet, which is really cool. But yeah, so this is something to keep in mind. Um, and the next type of emission I would like to discuss is a, a more recent uh, uh, a suggestion that is we call the planet induced radio emission. And I think this suggestion came from an inspiration again in the solar system uh, between the, of the interaction between Jupiter and Io. Uh, and here you have uh, for um, contextualization, this, this, the, what I'm gonna talk about is the I, Jupiter makes up for the star and Io makes up for the exoplanet. But the idea of this emission is that you have electrons that are spiraling around uh, this uh, this field line, and essentially these are generating also is electron cyclotron maser emission. The point is like you, if you see in this in this artistic um, image that you have magnetic field lines that are connecting the planet and the star, and you can only see connection if the planet is orbiting in sub alphavenic orbit which means the magnetic energy around this planet is uh, from, from the stellar wind is dominating over the kinetic energy. And this is quite important because otherwise you would not see waves traveling uh, towards the planet. And if you were to observe this type of emission, again, if you recall my, my, my formula I showed before, it's very similar, except that now, instead of having emission coming from the planet, the emission is coming from the star, but it has be, it's being induced by the planet. So that's the idea. So if you observe at this frequency range, for example, you get the magnetic field of the star, or you can do the other way around, you know the magnetic field of the star, you can figure out what is the, 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 the frequency of the observation. And I say this has been a recent, um, a recent development in the area of radio emission from planets because in 2020, Vedantan and co-authors, they, they identified a very uh, highly polarized emission from this M dwarf, which is very boring, apparently, but it started showing this emission. Um, and they suggested at that, at that time that this emission was consistent with a, a planet that hasn't been detected, uh, that had an orbital period of between one and five days. And since then, LOFAR, I mean the land of LOFAR, so I have to talk about LOFAR. <laughs> so at the end of the day, LOFAR um, observed uh, just through blind surveys, I think they, the survey was, was, was related to something else, but low, in this survey was identified several other M dwarfs who, who, which looked quite, uh, these are the M dwarfs, which looked quite inactive and not promising at all, and they end up having uh, a larger X-ray luminosity. So if you follow this relation that is known for uh, low mass stars between X-ray luminosity and radio luminosity, you see here, that for let's say 10 to 29 Earths per second, you would expect a radio luminosity of maybe 10 to 14 Earths per second per Hertz. And they see this, these planets being a lot more luminous in radio. Uh, so the suggestion was it's possible this most quiescent sources with low X-ray activity, they could actually having high radio emission because they have a, an unseen planet. So there's a lot to, to do in this field, in my, in my opinion. And we, we investigated two particular M-dwarf systems. Uh, 
Proxima Centauri and AUMIC. Uh, AUMIC is, is, is a very young star, I think it's about 20 million years. It has a, a two detected planets very close to the star. And Proxima, well, it's, it's, it's our Proxima, so the closest star to the solar system. Um, and you, we have also magnetic maps from this star, and we, we model their wings that I show here at the bottom. And now, remember I said to you that if you want to, if a planet uh, is, is, um, is connected to the star, the planet has to be within this region that is um, uh, sub alphivenic And you see here, in the case of Proxima, the planet is outside this alphavenic surface, while in the case of Eumic, according to our models, the pla both planets, there, most of their orbits, they are within the Zofvenic uh, surface. So the key point here to compare is the orbit of the planet with this white line. And you see here in the case of Proxima b, this planet could not induce a radio emission on the star. If we ever observe emission from this planet that is cyclotronic, highly polarized, it could be that the emission is coming from the activity of the from the magnetic field of the planet itself. And on the other hand, what we what we predict for AUMIC is that both planets are subalphavenic. And if you look very closely, you see that there is some uh, blue uh, region here. So this is the region where we estimate uh, emission would be generated, um, and and it would be induced in in the star. Um, right, so I think that's all I wanted to talk about in the radio part, and I want to move on to the, the second part, which is to talk about atmosphere escape. Um, and maybe I don't need to, to tell to convince you of this, but atmospheres are important in the uh, context, for example, of thinking about habitability of a planet. It's also important for understanding the distribution, the mass radius distributions uh, uh, of exoplanets, uh, because we think atmospheric mass loss scoops the, the planet. And, uh, and I'll talk mostly about transmission spectroscopy. So let me give you my theorist point of view of how transmission spectroscopy occurs. So you have your star here. This is your planet and your planet is losing some material. And uh, as the planet transits in front of the star, you would see the transit light curve of in the optical of something like that. But if your planet has a certain amount of element, uh, for example, hydrogen, your, your transit light curve would look something like that. And the way for you to observe this is by looking at the system, take a spectrum of your star when the planet is out of transit, then you, put, you wait until the planet is transiting the star, you take the spectral again, you divide the two spectra, and then you find the absorption of the, the amount of absorption that the atmosphere uh, is causing. So we call this transmission spectroscopy because the, the light of the star is transmitted through the atmosphere of the planet. I'm sure the process is a lot more complicated than what I just said, <laughs> um, but that's the general idea. And there are many observations now. So I think Lyman Alpha observations has been traditionally the way to observe evaporating atmospheres. And I'm showing you here an example of an M dwarf, a, a warm Neptune orbiting an M dwarf. And this is a fantastic, in my opinion, system. This is the, the light curve in the optical. This tiny little blip that most of you will not be able to see is the optical transit. And this huge, um, this huge absorption is the transiting Lyman alpha. So this is an indication that there is a huge cloud of material around this planet. Uh, more recently, well, the problem is for you to do Lyman alpha, you have to go to space. So uh, this, the, 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 more recently, there has been many works reporting detection escaping atmosphere in helium one. So this is a line in the near infrared. So you can do from the ground. And I think at the moment, the number of detected evaporating planets in helium, in just a few years of, of, of uh, research has already uh, 
overtaken the amount of Lyman alpha detections. And, and then you also have observation of um, metals. So I won't talk about metals. I will focus on Lyman alpha, a little bit on helium models that we are starting to develop. Uh, Luca is one of the pioneers in observing uh, metal escaping from, from atmospheres of planets. So the idea here is that these planets, they are, um, if you if you look at all these planets that I, I mentioned, they are usually planets that are orbiting very close to the star. So they they receive a high uh, rate or high flux of high energy um, radiation. And the idea, if you have an X UV photon with energy greater than 13.6 EV, you can ionize your neutral hydrogen. So 13.6 is used to ionize, and the rest of the energy is converted into thermal energy. So at the end of the day, if you have a planet that has a hydrogen-rich atmosphere, you end up having um, an excess energy that is converted in thermal motion. This, this heating uh, essentially increases the temperature of your planet. The atmosphere expands because now it's hotter, and it's more easy. Uh, it's easier than to evaporate. So that's the, again, a very simple way to understand that. And I'll come back to the first, uh, one of my first slides, which was how the UV and X-ray radiation evolves with time. Remember, I need photons that are above 13.6 EV. So I want to look in X-ray and UV. And um, some of the, uh, I'm gonna highlight one work that Daria, uh, published. He has a, a bunch of paper. I think this one was up on archive last week, this week, yesterday. No. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah, maybe Monday. <laughs> I have not read the paper yet. I only saw the figures. <laughs> but if you look here, this is a, a, a so Daria stole MESA. MESA is a stellar evolution model. So she stole the model and she applied to planet evolution. But what you have here is the how the radius of the planet evolve as a function of age. And just thinking about what happens if there is no escape and you compare if there is escape happening, you see that the radius of the planet evolves sub substantially. Um, so if escape affects the structure of the planet, I like to think of this as if you if you remember also from your basic stellar uh, physics uh, courses, when you think about a star that loses a lot of mass through a stellar wind, if you want to, to, to see the evolution of the star in the HR diagram, you see that depending on how much wind this star is losing, it, the, 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 how it will, the, the, the the, the track it will perform in the HR is different. So I think it's 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 a similar analogy. So we don't have an HR diagram for the planets, but it's a similar analogy how this is how the planet changes depending on the amount of evolution. Now that I also made the public the lists for running MESA uh, available. So you can play with the, the this uh, the code. Uh, and I also want to highlight the work by Andrew Allen uh, where he, what he did was essentially looking at these evolutionary curves for X-ray and UV luminosity, and 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 also highly inspired by the work uh, from from these people here in Vienna uh, on seeing how much mass a certain planet would have lost through its evolution, depending on whether it was orbiting a star that was born as a fast rotator or a slow rotator. And just to illustrate in this case, so we have evaporation rate as a function of age. If you integrate this blue curve, for example, you can get the total amount of mass that was lost. And in this particular case, it was about 20%. But what we did, what we wanted to do in this work was actually to make predictions of what we can observe. And therefore, for each of the models, we computed the, 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 the observational signature in Lyman alpha and in H alpha. And you have here the, the absorption of the, the, the planet in the atmosphere as a function of either the velocity or uh, the wavelength. Um, and the color here indicates age where the, the darker colors are younger and the uh, lighter colors are older planets. So in general, what you see is that the Lyman alpha line is broad. Notice that the Lyman alpha is always, uh, is always uh, saturated. So it's 100% absorption. But the, the wings are, 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 are broader for younger 
planets. And in H alpha, if you compute the, 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 the difference between this part and this part of the line, uh, you see that we, we expect transits that are about three or four percent in excess of the geometric transit. Um, and I, I have a little note here, I'm going to come back to this, but notice that all these lines, they are symmetric about the zero velocity, the zero Doppler velocity. And it's a problem with our models, and I'll come back to that. And in more recent works, what uh, Andrew is doing is to compute the evolution of atmospheric escape as seen through the helium-1 lines. And again, here we have a number of uh, models. Uh, this is the transit depth in helium now that we predict as a function of age of the system. And, and here I have the, the one line for a younger uh, planet and then the, the, the helium line for an older planet. Again, this is a, a warm uh, Neptune. And you see the, the helium line is essentially here is, is three components. Uh, so you have, if you look at each individual component of these lines, they are also symmetric at the zero velocity. They are slightly shifted here because uh, they have a different uh, uh, central wavelengths. And then you, you, the final predicted observed uh, line would be the one in black. Now you see here, we, 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 ex we predict a lot of absorption for very young systems uh, and less in, in older systems. And the reason for that is because the star here is shown in the, as white light, uh, white circle. And you see here that there is a lot more absorbing atmosphere in the case of a younger planet than in the case of an older planet. Now, if you, this is what I call, uh, we call extinction. So this is the amount of atmosphere that is going to be uh, uh, where the light of the star is gonna be transmitted through. So the thicker it is, the higher the extinction, the more the absorption, and therefore the transit depth will be uh, higher. But again, if we look at the individual components, we see again a symmetric line profile. And the whole reason for that is that we are using a 1D model, which assumes the atmosphere of the planet is um, spherically symmetric. And therefore, we have a symmetric line profiles. But we know from observations and also from models that the planets, they don't just evaporate symmetrically. In general, what you would see is the sort of a, what we call a comet-like tail. And um, in the last part of my talk, I would like to focus on the work that we are developing. Uh, in looking at how the interaction of the stellar wind takes place uh, with, uh, with the atmosphere of the planet. Now, if you want to talk about uh, this, we cannot do 1D models anymore. We go 3D. And this has been a uh, part of a lot of effort for the past couple of years. This was a PhD student that I had. Uh, so we, we developed um, uh, this framework uh, to study this problem in a, in a number of papers. Gopal Hasgra uh, and also Daria worked with this as well when she was my virtual postdoc. So what we have here is a planet uh, in this 3D grid, and we have the stellar wind that is injected in this grid. So we, we call these local simulations because we don't simulate the star and the planet together. We only look at the planet inside a little box and the star is seen is an uh, is something uh, is outside our our numerical domain. The lines here in this particular case are streamlines of velocity from the stellar wind and these are the streamlines of velocity in black from the planetary outflow and I'll, I'll point you here to the sonic surface and I'll come back to the sonic surface. So I think this this this, this animation shows a lot more what we 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 do. So this is uh, the planet the, the stellar wind is being is going to be injected so I, 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 it's a, a little movie. As soon as I started, the wind is injected in, in the simulation. Um, the orbital motion is, is pointing up. You see here there is a little shadow behind the planet. 
because the, 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 the photons come uh, in our simulation, the photons are coming in, in plane parallel. Um, but, and I, let me play the movie. So as soon as the, the wind is injected, you start to see the evaporating atmosphere taking a different shape. It was nearly spherically symmetric at the beginning. Now it has this comet-like uh, uh, shape. Uh, so this tail is shaped both by the interaction with the stellar wind as with the orbital motion. Uh, if your planet is orbiting in a subsonic region, you also see the form, the formation of a shock. And um, the whole conclusion here is that it's not only the irradiation of the star that shapes the evaporation, but also the stellar wind. And one of the, our first studies was to, to, to it was a, a parametric study in which we put a planet in the center of the grid. So these are 3D simulations, but for visualization, I'm just showing the orbital uh, part of the planet. And we inject the stellar wind uh, with different conditions. So this is twice uh, this value of the solar wind mass loss rate, 10 times and 20 times. And, um, and this little white surface here is the sonic surface. So below this, the, the planetary outflow is subsonic and above it is supersonic. And what you see is that as we increase the strength of the, the, the stellar wind, this sonic surface, which used to be nearly spherical, it becomes disturbed. And what we noticed were two things that um, for stronger winds, the amount of atmosphere, uh, the volume that is occupied, the atmosphere of the planet occupies becomes smaller. And the other thing is whenever you start to disrupt the original surface, sonic surface of the planet, you actually start to get a lower escape rate. And uh, I, I, I can explain the physics uh, afterwards in more details, but the idea is that if your if your wind uh, is too strong, is you essentially uh, the 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 wind of the star and the planet start to talk with each other. So if you are in the subsonic regime, the planet starts to listen to the stellar wind, <laughs> and the stellar wind is saying to the planet, reduce your evaporation. Now it's not a strong uh, reduction, but I'll, I'll show you that. We were look. We were interested on this um, also from the observational perspective. So these are the same models, a little, a few more models here. But we are increasing the mass loss rate from uh, right to left. And the first X here is a model with no stellar wind, twice times the mass loss rate, uh, and so on and so forth until you reach a hundred times the solar wind mass loss rate. This is the amount of atmospheric escape the planet has. And here is the amount of Lyman alpha absorption that we predict in these models. Now, what you see here is that uh, there you start to increase the strength of your stellar wind and nothing actually happens to the evaporation of the planet. So at this point, the planet doesn't listen to the star. That's my, my, my simple way to put that. But on the other hand, because the volume occupied by the escaping atmosphere is getting smaller and smaller, you see a lot less absorption in Lyman alpha. As soon as you disrupt the sonic surface, then the planet starts to reduce, uh, the escape rate starts to, to be reduced. Now, it's not, uh, I thought this was going to be a lot higher, the reduction. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's a, fa as a factor of a few only. But uh, from my theoretical perspective, it was, was very interesting. The most of the effect is actually on the obs what you observe. Now, we then, at that time, there was the discovery of AU MIP B. So this, uh, this uh, planet, Neptune-sized planet orbiting uh, this star that still has a debris disk. And we were in a bit of a dichotomy because on one hand, the star has a very high UV flux because if you remember, it's very young. So with a lot of UV flux, you expect the planet to evaporate a lot. But on the other hand, when the star is young, it also has a very strong wind. And now in this work, we are saying, well, maybe if a stronger wind, you are going to 
uh, reduce the evaporation of the planet. So we were a bit of a, a dichotomy here. So we run a few simulations to investigate what would happen to the system. And I have here a comparison just between two cases. This is the planet evaporating and the stellar wind a factor of 10, and the stellar wind a factor of 1,000 from the solar value. So these were the the the... the these were the predicted values for stellar winds from the system coming from different authors. Um, they were not in agreement. And, and when you go from this left panel to the right panel to the middle panel here, we only see a reduction of 50%. But if I would like to check what would be that in the transit signatures, you see that there is actually a very strong influence. So you start with a, a, a model with a, a weak wind would have about uh, six, 10% of absorption, but a, a, a larger stellar wind would increase, um, would actually de uh, nearly remove the Lyman alpha, Lyman alpha signature from the system. So in, in, in this case, we were talking about uh, transit signatures that could be erased by the stellar wind simply because the atmosphere would be so confined that we would not detect anything. But I always like to try to think about the, the positive side of our work. So is this bad for the transit? It is bad for the transit, but we can maybe invert this and try to use the transits to predict the properties of the stellar wind. And um, this, is, this was a, a postdoc fellow who worked with me. Uh, and and in, in her work, she has a, she also has, this is Carolina, she has a 3D code as well to calculate evaporation and interaction with winds. Her code is, is different in which she puts the star and the planet in the same uh, numerical domain. But what, what I would like to highlight are just, uh, this is, uh, she was modeling GJ436b, this, the, the fascinating planet that I mentioned that had very tiny uh, optical transit, but a huge Lyman alpha transit. And what she has here, if you just focus on two curves, what she has is the same, uh, the same uh, evaporation model for, for the planet, but a different uh, stellar wind properties. And you see that only one of these would actually fit the observation data points, which are the crosses in the background, which means that uh, if, you, if you have observations, and, and, and I think that's where the, 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 the research in this whole area is very interesting, because if you couple the observations and the numerical efforts, you can actually try to probe or try to understand the properties of the stellar wind a lot better. And if you remember in my first slide, I mentioned that it's really hard to observe winds from these stars. Right, so I would like to talk very, maybe very quickly about uh, CMEs. Um, five minutes and more. Let me see what I have here. Maybe seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, let me see if I, I, I can try to see if, Okay, I will skip the CME part. I can, if anybody's interested, I can talk about that. Um, so let me, let me continue. <laughs> I'm happy to talk about CMEs, but we can talk later. <laughs> oh, let me, I want to talk about the magnetic field because I want to talk to Maxim afterwards. <laughs> uh, this is the, the recent uh, work we, we, we did. Uh, this paper was also the last paper of my PhD student, and I think it came about at the same time that Maxim put the paper, his paper on, on archive. The, the idea of what I showed you before was a hydrodynamic model. So we spent a lot of time trying to think about what, how to include the magnetic field in our simulations. And what you have here is a planet that is evaporating, but now this planet is magnetized. And if you remember, this before we had this comet-like tail trailing the planet, and now what we have is a double tail trailing the planet, because what happens here is that part of the atmosphere of the planet becomes trapped in what we call the dead zone, the region where the magnetic field is closed, and part of the atmosphere then is channeled along the open field lines. Now, if this planet has a dipolar field, you have one flow coming from the North Pole and another flow coming from the South, the south Pole. So the magnetic field changes the dynamic 
of the atmosphere, and you end up forming not one, but two uh, tails. If you see now again the, the, the system uh, on side view, this is the planet without magnetic field, and this is a planet with a 10 Gauss magnetic field, and you start to see this formation of uh, polar, polar flows. Now I live in theory land, and I started thinking, wow, this is very interesting, because if you notice the tail on the north and the tail on the south, they are slightly different because of, of the, how the magnetic field of the stellar wind interacts with the magnetic field of the planet. And if I were to, to transit my planet with this impact parameter, or if I would transit my planet with that impact parameter, you cover slightly different uh, regions in the of the of the disk of the star, so you could have an effect in the observations, but it's too small. So it's only for the theorists that is this one. For the observers, I don't think they will ever um, ever see that. But what we conclude is if we change the strength of the magnetic field of the planet, we see these are the, the, the mass loss rate computed at different uh, positions. Let's just look at the, the, the total one. But you see that the the, as the magnetic field of the planet increases, you see a slight increase in evaporation. So the magnetic field is not protecting the atmosphere. Um, but again, we see factor of uh, feel two at most, but you see a, a strong effect on the observational signature. So this is the Lyman alpha line for a planet with 10 Gauss and a planet with zero Gauss field. Um, I'll skip this slide just in the interest of time, um, but I can talk a little bit about that later. It's, it's related to the degeneracy of the models, you could have similar percentage of transit for a planet that does not have a magnetic field, but has a strong wind, and a planet that has a magnetic field with a weak wind. And then the question is, how can I remove this degeneracy? Um, this, the, the answer is to do multi-line observation, but um, I'll skip that and I'll go to my conclusions. So I hope I entertained you a little bit uh, with, uh, with my talk today. So I, far, I first talked about how winds interact with the planets, and then this could give rise to radio emission. So the type, what I call the first type of radio emission, follows the radio Boltz law, the, the, the law we see in the solar system. And the second one that is a very uh, popular uh, topic at the moment is the planet-induced emission in the stellar corona. How escape, uh, atmospheric escape and the evolution of the planet depends also on what the host star is doing through its life. The stellar wind can uh, reduce atmospheric escape, but not, not substantially as I first thought, but more importantly, it can erase the alignment of uh, uh, transit signatures. And, um, and I skip this a little bit, but uh, I can talk later about the CMEs if anybody's interested. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Adeline, thank you. Uh, for the nice talk. And we are actually having quite some time for questions. Um, so if you show me, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Alina, thank you. Nice talk. Thank you. All the interesting stuff, and I have many questions. Maybe we can. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, today, only one. Uh, okay. <laughs> because, yeah, from radio, helium, uh, this 3D simulation and magnetic field, everything we can discuss. I can yes, yes, yes. But uh, today, I want to just clarify from our scale. Uh, what is the context of your 3D simulation? Uh, so you said that uh, stellar wind is not modeled, so you prescribe it. On the other hand, uh, the star is not only the wind, there is a gravity, and uh, how do you also uh, describe the mass loss? So the radiation, gravity, yes, yes. and wind, how this uh, three parts of mm -hmm. because uh, the pictures uh, you show if it surprises me, uh, I would expect if uh, the planet is 
sufficiently close to the star, you have also the arm of uh, escaping material, uh, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. up to the star, mm -hmm. but somehow. Yes, yes, it's... you're you're absolutely right. So we do have. I, I did not mention in details, but we do account for. So essentially what we are doing is the photo evaporation. So we account for the deposition of energy uh, in the atmosphere of the planet. That's what drives the outflow of the planet. We also account for, we are solving everything in the co-rotating frame. So there is of course the gravity of the star. So there are tidal forces. And what you just described from the arm, uh, the, the, this, this what we call the accretion arm. So if, if it only happens when you are in simulations with, uh, uh, stronger outflow from the planet and weaker stellar winds yeah, close, uh, yes, 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 yes 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 uh, yes yeah. yes 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 so what you see in some of these models i did not have time to see but you 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 also see I don't know if you can see it from here, but some of these models that Carolina produced also shows uh, the formation. It's like you know, you start to, to see the, the the formation of this accretion ahead of the the motion of uh, this accretion arm ahead of the motion of the planet. So this is accounted for, but in the simulation, the results I showed you, our wind are, is probably too strong. Yeah, you didn't mention the orbital. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, that was having in mind. I think was HD. Some of that was for the HD 209458. Uh, so it's about 10 or 10 ish uh, stellar radius. Maybe we, we postpone. Yeah. 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 No, no. I, I would like to also maybe mm -hmm. some students would have uh, maybe a question, a basic question. Or... Are you a student? Are you a student? <laughs> the basic questions are the toughest ones, I have to say. Yeah, Helmut has his arm. I'm starting also yeah. <laughs> a comment regarding uh, regarding this radio emission mm -hmm. from the Sol Jupiter. So mm -hmm. did some studies also more recently, I think two years ago and last year maybe. 2008. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's one open maybe I can give you these papers mm -hmm. if you you may not know them. Uh, that if you have this hot Jupiter so close to the planet, yeah. Then uh, you can see that uh, the whole, if it has a magnetosphere, the whole magnetic cavity is filled with dense plasma mm -hmm. because the atmosphere is yes. expanding and you have 500 or yeah. more mm -hmm. uh, times higher in mm -hmm. And uh, some student of us did some mm -hmm. checks. And then you have a problem that if you generate the radio emission, you can't, stuff, yeah. yeah. It may not escape. Yeah, yeah. I think the problem is, yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, yeah. The problem the interesting thing is, because you mentioned how mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. which is very heavy. Yes, exactly. And I don't know exactly now what the, mm -hmm. the distance, but we, we also looked into this and we, we predicted that planets in that time, they have, uh, due to the higher gravity, the atmosphere is not so yes. expanded. Yeah. So you have uh, mm -hmm. a cavity, thinner plasma. Uh, up to a magneto yeah, yeah. and it is maybe possible. Easter yes, yes, yeah. No, no, I agree. I agree. I, I yeah. yes. No, 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 yeah. no, no, I agree. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, this is something I think I have also as we work anyway. We look on that because I'm starting to think on a work for next year mm -hmm. uh, to look into helium planets mm -hmm. because I expect that there will be planets, a lot of them. In the low mass domain, mm -hmm. which may have lost the hydrogen from a primordial atmosphere, but uh, helium remains. Mm -hmm. So you can expect that there may be many planets which have a huge amount of helium mm -hmm. and not hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Probably a gross mass planet with a dense helium atmosphere, mm -hmm. which could not be lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm planning to, to look deeper into this in the new, new year. Yeah, no, no, no. no. But to, to get an idea about the mass of a planet, mm -hmm. uh, the radiation mm -hmm. field, and, mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. all this, so that we know more or less what we may expect. Uh, and if this method can observe such uh, atmospheres, yes, be yes. And so, regarding your first point, Helmut, I, I, I am I'm familiar with the paper. We did actually, I did not have uh, time to go through the list of why we're not seeing it. But in general, I agree with you, if the planet has a higher gravity, the atmosphere is less extended, so the condition for ECMI is met. And it's it, the, unfortunately, we, we have uh, new 
models for Taubu, it's really hard to predict the flux they observe. Well, for us, I mean, for us, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know. But it's it's not related to the planet atmosphere okay. itself. It's more related to the 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 wind yeah. uh, the wind required for for that. But it's also a work from a master's student, so I still we still need to to investigate a little bit more um, regarding your second question. I would your second. I would be very interested in understanding. I, I was talking to Daria just before the, the seminar. I would be very interested in understanding better how you lose hydrogen, but not helium. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yes, yes. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, wow, now we have. OK, I, I pick Peter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. I have. Uh... Very, I think, uh, yeah, a simple question. Yeah, um, if I get correctly, uh, before you said that, like for the Lyman Alpha, you need like space observation. Mm -hmm. I mean, why? Because like, why can I can I not use like uh, high resolution spectroscopy mm -hmm. from the ground? Ah, okay, okay. So the the problem with Lyman Alpha, oh, well, it's not a problem. It's good for us. We have the ozone layer that protects the ultraviolet light to get in the Earth. So we, if you want to observe anything in the UV, we have to go above the ozone layer at this moment, maybe not in the future. <laughs> but, um, and, and, and therefore these observations, they become really, really expensive because you have to put a satellite in space to be able to, 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 to see these photons. If you now, uh, helium is, is fall, falls in the near infrared part of the, it's the, the, the window of the, the, of the atmosphere of the earth. So in, on that, in that, in that case, the, 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 the near infrared light comes to, to us. And then we can use what you mentioned, for example, high resolution, high spectroscopy and, and observe them from the ground. So it's more a problem with the, the technical, uh, you know, what passes through our atmosphere and not, yeah. Okay. So Lyman, even if you if you go into space on a low orbit, you still have problems with Lyman alpha observations like HST. It's very quite tricky to even observe Lyman alpha. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. now now I think it's Ludmilla time. You know you're you're the experts UV observers next door to you. <laughs> um, regarding the comparison between Almic and Proxima Sandy, right? You showed for Proxima Sand the uh, Alphane radius, but that changes due to the cycle of the star, right? So how much does it change? Can Proxima Sand actually be inside, or I mean, or not? I mean. Because it's, it seems quite a close, it's a actually. question I want you to, to 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 see to understand. The it is possible. Uh, the the you're right. I think that when the time these observations this because we we real our wind models rely on knowing the magnetic field of the star. When these uh, magnetic field observations were taken, the star was apparently a maximum. Ah, okay. So the you we only have one map so far. Hopefully, there will be more coming mm -hmm. in, and then we can and and for us to identify the position of the alpha surface, we need to do the model, and the model then depends on the magnetic field of the star. So ideally, we would like to trace the the the, the stellar wind through the cycle. So it is possible that. The, the position of the it's very likely the position of the alvin the alvin surface will change, um, but in general it's larger at maximum. Yeah, so yeah, that, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, okay, mm -hmm. I thought that mm -hmm. probably makes unlikely that proxima sand people inside will be inside. Yeah, it yeah. is. There are some there are some works that looked at a higher a higher uh, frequency that they 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 seem to 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 find a recurrent observation recurrent emission in in radio. From the system, and it looks like the the the, the emission is aligned with the, the planet when it's in quadrature. So it could be that there 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 is emission happening. We need to refine our models. There is still some work. Uh, unfortunately, with the models we have at the moment, it's really hard to make the planet inside the the mm -hmm. alpha surface. But maybe the models have to be improved. Who knows? If I may, second question. Um, I think. Okay, then then I don't <laughs> Sorry? Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, no, no, our models, the star is rotating, yes. Okay. So the and mm -hmm. the I don't think it's very fast, Proxima. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, no, no, we have rotation, yeah. Okay, if I may ask a question myself. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was intrigued by your finding that a strong stellar wind is actually makes the escape rate going down. Mm -hmm. My question was about the inner boundary condition of on the planet. I can easily, you know, imagine that once you, 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 you have your model and it expands and you push it away kind of, that it's somehow dependent on, on mm -hmm. the solar wind, but in the end, shouldn't the, the planet kind of give it, well, let, let, let more mass from the inside go through. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you explain the, the inner boundary yeah, condition? Yeah. So the inner boundary condition we kept uh, fixed through, through all the simulations. Uh, what is Which one, the, 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 the velocity the or the, the... The velocity, in, no, the, the density and the temperature of right. the planet we keep fixed. What happens here is actually a very interesting uh, problems of two flows encountering each other. So what happens if you, you it's, if your if your flow has a velocity that is subsonic, you can transfer information from the other flow to the to the subsonic flow. So you essentially connect the star and the planet when they are both in 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 a subsonic uh, regime, and. Um, and in this scenario, what happened is that the 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 the, the stellar wind starts to to essentially um, disrupt the, the 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 region where the acceleration of the outflow of the planet is taking place, and therefore this is what reduces the escape rate. Now, I when I was thinking about this problem in one D initially, I thought it was essentially going to shut down the, the outflow of the planet, and I did some some, but we, it doesn't in three D. We see it, it's not the case because there's still escaping happening in the night side. Uh, so, so, so it it moves the um, the critical point in the wind outside. Exactly, it moves the critical point. Yes, that's outside it. or inside. Well, it, inside. well originally it was. Um, so originally, the critical point was this little circle, and then in the interacting scheme, uh, uh, when the, the, the two are interacting, the critical point that was here now is there, you see. Um, and then I understand, because then... It's e, 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 yeah, and, 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 yeah, and this is the intermediate scenario, and then this is the, 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 the strong uh, uh, interaction. But it's very interesting, and when I, when I thought about this problem, I went to look into... Uh, simulations of the heliosphere of the solar wind interacting with the ISM, and there are there is a very interesting work that was the the the, the thought experiment was what happened if the ISM was either, either denser or a higher velocity. We had higher velocity through the ISM, and they also see this the solar wind uh, being shut down at at times, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, very urgent question. Now, stop the recording. Yeah.